A play group for children with Down syndrome meets once a month on a Friday, and everyone has a good time. <laughs> Down syndrome is a developmental disorder caused by an extra chromosome. There are 47 instead of the usual 46. The condition is named after John Langdon Down, a British physician who described the syndrome in 1866. So Down syndrome is the most common genetic form of intellectual disability. Um, it occurs in one to 600 to 800 live births. Dr. Jamie Edgen is with the University of Arizona's Down Syndrome Research Group, which is funded by the Thrasher Research Fund and the Down Syndrome Research Treatment Foundation. She says even though the condition is so prevalent, we don't know much about it. Some children may never talk, and that's, that's fairly rare, um, but some children may never talk. And then we have individuals that we know that go on speaking tours to talk about Down syndrome and what it's like to have Down syndrome. So there is a, a, a tremendous amount of variation in outcomes, and um, we don't really understand why. They have some craniofacial features that kind of put them at risk. So they have an underdeveloped face and jaw. They have enlarged adenoids and tonsils. Um, they tend to have uh, lower muscle tone. The tongue in Down syndrome is enlarged and often is too far back and too far down. So that would make this airway a lot smaller. Researcher Jennifer Breslin wanted to find out if in children with Down syndrome, there was a connection between sleep problems and the ability to learn. It was the first time a study like this had ever been done. If we can demonstrate that kids with poor sleep have poor cognitive outcomes, we can make a case for intervention. Um, and that would be huge. Zip, flush, kapow. He thought and thought and thought about what he was Zip. missing. Zip. Flash. Flash and In the past four years, Jennifer has seen more than 60 families, all volunteers willing to participate. She begins right, each case by conducting a home sleep study to find out if the child is having sleep problems. We have them wear a uh, sleep vest, um, which contains most of the recording equipment. And we give the kids and the parents some basic instructions. We read them a storybook about what's going to happen to them that night and what kind of data we're recording. Point to dishes. Oh, nice work, Bella. Mm -hmm. After data from the sleep test is downloaded back at the lab, it is determined if the child has a sleep problem or not. Here I'm looking at a couple of different things. On the top are the uh, EEG. Next, tests are given to assess a child's IQ and other areas of learning function, again, usually in the home. These exercises were specifically designed to test kids with Down syndrome and were developed by researchers in the U of A psychology department. Another test of um, hippocampal function, which is, we know is very, very sensitive to sleep um, and variation in sleep, um, is being able to bind together pieces of information, so by an object to a spatial location and remember where objects are in the world. One of the things that goes wrong in Down syndrome is the development of the hippocampus. It is not working quite right in, in uh, kids with Down syndrome, so they have memory problems. They have problems with the specific kinds of memory that you need a hippocampus for. Hippocampus is not important for all kinds of memory. It's particularly important for remembering specific episodes. Regents Professor of Psychology, Professor Lynn Nadell, is a leading expert on the hippocampus and learning and memory and how it applies to Down syndrome. He's also Jennifer's advisor. Putting those things together that the hippocampus is really important for the sort of things that, for, the, for aspects of memory that are influenced by sleep, and that hippocampus is not working so well in Down syndrome, and that led us to the thought that, well, you know, if there were some problem with sleep in Down syndrome, that would potentiate their problems with hippocampus, their already existing problems with hippocampus, and those might dovetail into uh, somehow uh, contributing to their overall cognitive impairment. Teenager Mark Frederick was a volunteer in Jennifer's study. After a sleep test, it turned out he had severe apnea. Marcy Frederick is Mark's mom. It's more the pausing, you know, when the, when the breathing stops. And, and that's the part that can be really frightening for a parent. 
Marcy says the fragmented sleep was making Mark tired and irritable. Quiet. We would get uh, reports from school that there was a lot of sleeping on the desk and, um, and you know, by the time he got home, he would just be exhausted and, and uh, yeah, there was just a lot of sleepiness, argumentative, and um, just saying no to everything, you know, to requ just uncooperative. Once they were able to help Mark breathe better by elevating him and using a special mattress, he was able to sleep. Is it good? Yes. Yeah. Good. And soon was a completely different person. How do you feel now? Really good. How's school going? It's really good. Thanks for asking. What we noticed was just a more, he was just more himself, you know, he just his, his own personality came through and was more cooperative and um, just everything flowed better, you know, uh, more productive in school and around here. Jennifer is about halfway done with her study and is already seeing dramatic results. So, so far we have found a um, pretty robust relationship between sleep apnea severity and ability to learn spatial locations. So I would say that's a pretty um, strong finding that we have for sure that I can tell you. Look up high. Sleep apnea can be treated with special devices to aid in breathing. Sometimes having tonsils or adenoids removed will also solve the problem. If this study indeed proves a link between sleep apnea and learning ability, it won't mean a cure for Down syndrome, but it's certainly a step in the right direction. But let's assume that once it's shown that this really matters, that there will be more attention paid to how can we fix it. How can we actually help these kids get a decent night's sleep? And on the assumption that if they could get a decent night's sleep, at least that contribution to their cognitive impairment would be diminished. I mean, if we could give these kids a better quality of life, help more of these kids go further in work and in school and in relationships and things like that, that would be awesome. Goodbye, goodbye, goodbye.